player in his own right. I mean, you can see here, look at his accomplishments. I mean, he's one of the most decorated players at the moment in the traded card game. Yeah, he's one of the most decorated players in the whole of uh, the Europe, let alone <laughs> Norway, where he's clearly just been cleaning up at the last few national championships there. And, of course, Michael Long, absolutely no slouch himself, as we will uh, no doubt be able to see when we just go over to him. He's uh, just a massive stream of accomplishments with achievements at internationals, at yeah, nationals, and at the World, World Championships, and in the seniors division. And this is, you have to remember that this is Michael Long's first year in Masters, and already he's achieved so much. And look at him here in the top four. Absolutely. Michael Long is, uh, again, as you were saying, Nick, he is a, a senior who has gone into the Masters division. He did so well in the seniors division that he's actually progressed and continued doing that into the Masters division. And what I love about Michael Long in this case is he's consistently stuck with his Greninja deck. You know, a lot of people came into this tournament and were worried about that Giratina with the ability, which obviously uh, was very easy to tech into to decks as a one-off. Um, he's completely ignored that and just said, hey, this is my favorite deck. This is the deck that I love to play. I'm going to take this to the tournament yeah. and sorry beg your pardon Nick. No, no it's okay so yeah absolutely when it comes to a deck like Greninja you know sometimes it does suffer from these consistency issues it is one of these decks that as we say can lose to itself quite a lot but when you have as much experience with the deck as someone as Mike, like Michael Long does and you just play the decks over and over and over again you can try and you know do these sort of small plays that can just buy you those extra turns to get that setup going and to minimize the amount of times that that sort of thing will happen and Michael has obviously put, been able to put that to great effect here as he's now sitting in the top four facing off against one of Europe's best absolutely and sometimes you know experience is you know in this case much uh, a much more better asset to have than uh, consistency I mean, obviously once Greninja is set up and it's in full flow it's such a, a powerful deck in its own regards I mean when you have those giant water shurikens going off and you are doing 60 damage and then you're retreating doing another 60 damage and then you still have your attack for the turn it's such a as you know as we were saying a very powerful and unique deck um, but as you say there are some some, some consistency, uh, consistency issues um, obviously what Michael has done here is he's perfected the deck so much so that um, you know he's minimize that uh, that uh, you know the the consistency issues within the deck um, doing so well you know consistently with it and getting all the way here to the top four of this international event yeah absolutely and of course as we mentioned he really up against Todd Rekulov one of the most decorated players in the whole of Europe and he will be playing as you were corrected yesterday <laughs> not so Glycopod Zorok but Zorok with Glycopod as this uh, alternative attacker mainly focusing on this Zorok GX strategy going to be able to <laughs> you know using the trade ability to draw more cards every single turn and to really put out some really mean damage with that right is beating very appropriately named attack. <laughs> Absolutely. And yes, we were told off yesterday by Todd that it is not uh, Golisopod, it is Zoroark with Golisopod in there. And in terms of this matchup, this is something uh, you would have to feel that uh, even as strong as Greninja is once it is set up, you would have to feel that this matchup does kind of swing in Todd's favor just because he has that Golisopod. And obviously when it does go from the bench into the active spot, it's hitting 120 damage. And Greninja is actually weak to grass type Pokemon. So that is doubling the damage that it's doing, which does one shot a Greninja Break, uh, which has 170 HP. Um, so you do have to feel one setup that this is in Todd's favor, but I'd be very interested to see how this match is going to play out. Yeah, absolutely. One of the other strengths of the Greninja deck, as well as the massive amounts of damage it could put out with the giant water shurikens and the moonlight slashes, and you know, locking down some decks entirely with that means shadow stitching attack, which of course it means that your opponent can't use any Pokemon abilities for their right. next turn. It, it is the fact that this Greninja Break is 170 HP on a one prize attacker, but with Todd's deck, because he has this Glycepod, which can one-shot the Greninja Breaks very easily for just a single energy attachment as long as he's able to bring it from the bench to the active and trigger that extra damage of first impression. It means that he's actually going to be able to try, trade quite well and make sure that he's able to keep up a consistent stream of you know one-shot, 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 and that's going to be the way he's going to keep up when he's, all of his attackers are worth two prizes when Michael's are only worth one. Absolutely, and uh, you do mention that Shadow Stitching attack. That is a very uh, vital attack that he does have within his deck. Um, there is the handshake, and we are off. He starts with the lone Froakie. Um, he, I think in this matchup, he is going to be safe. Um, presuming, okay, yeah, so he doesn't attach the, the single water energy to the Froakie, just because in case my, uh, in case Tor does have the Tapu Lele GX with the double colors energy, that would be a knockout on the Froakie. But even still so, he does have the two Froakie, so he is guaranteed, uh, subject to whether he, ha uh, he has it or not, the Frogadier for next turn to use water duplicates. Yeah, it also means that if the Todd is able to knock out a lone Froakie, he won't just lose the game because that would be bad, obviously. <laughs> yeah, so we don't want a repeat of our last uh, feature match where we had uh, mm -hmm. that uh, Registeel knocking out that uh, the Rolts. But here we go. We see Todd going into his deck. 
obviously the first look into the deck is your deck search so you are given a little bit more time to work out what's prized and as you can see a player as experienced as Todd I mean you can see the um, the concentration on his face looking at through his deck trying to work out you know okay what are the prizes what do I have in there what are the resources that I have to work with and um, if we look at the price cam actually I don't think that he has anything too pivotal in there that's going to really affect him this game no and the same for, for Michael's side as well I just have his uh, I believe a one-off star me prize which could be a little bit annoying but uh, in the early stages of the game he's going to be focusing more on static up and uh, taking prizes with his uh, you know, Greninja's anyway so he has a, he's going to have a little bit of time to fish that out but uh, in terms of the rest of his deck actually the one in hand Sammy has prize could be a little bit annoying he does play two of those but that's going to be one of the ways he's able to keep up tempo with Tor discarding those vital double colorless energies which he'll be using to you know attack with Writer's Beating or to you know, maybe in late stages of the game he wants to do armor press to maybe prevent uh, Greninja's from KOing his Goliath spots as easily that might be something he wants to go with too. Absolutely and uh, you can see there Tor playing one of his three Bridgets. He plays three Bridgets in this deck and he gave reasoning for it actually which was in the later game the one you have trade when you have Zoroark's ability trade that you uh, you don't want you know specific cards in your hand so therefore you just discard more Bridgets because uh, you know why not you don't really need them and in the early game it just gives you that extra consistency of making sure that you always have a Bridget uh, turn one as you can see here he does have that Bridget turn one he searched out the, the basic Pokemon that he needs which is the Tapu Koko and the two Wimpods uh, so he is <laughs> putting a lot of emphasis in this matchup as you can see going with uh, what will be Golisopod GX to knock out those Frokies and those Frogadiers and what's so great about Golisopod is that it only requires that one grass energy to uh, deal damage with. Yeah, absolutely. And as you were saying, the, where you're able to play a deck uh, in a list like this where you can play three Bridget, most decks only have to play one or two Bridget because they figure, oh, you know, we have four Ultra Balls and uh, maybe three, three, two or four Tapu Leles. It should be enough means to find that Bridget or maybe even just having it in the opening hand without even needing to bench a Tapu Lele. We've taught able to play three of them. The likelihood of him opening with it without even needing to invest that Tapu Lele resource is so strong and it means that he can free up his bench for a lot of other things or maybe he can use Tapu Lele in the later game to search out a Guzma for the win, for example. Absolutely, yeah. So it's a very uh, very well thought out strategy there from Tord. Michael does have the Frogadier, so he is looking to use that water duplicate. He does have the energy because we saw that in his first hand, and it wasn't sort of uh, manipulated by uh, Tord, you know, with an N or anything like that. So he is going for that water duplicate. Um, you would have to feel, though, that if Tord has the resources, he gets the Golisopod out, he perhaps attaches a Floatstone to uh, his active Zorua, or which could be a Zoroark, um, which, has the, which will have the trade ability, meaning that he can access more cards. But that Frogadier isn't going to be there too long. Um, so at this moment, uh, moment in time, as I say, we were looking at the prize camp. There are no Frogadiers in there, which means he will have the maximum, uh, the maximum search here. He will have uh, four Frogadiers out on his bench, which gives him uh, you know, more option of getting into those break forms. Yeah, he did have to evolve his Froakie on the bench as well as his one in the active because he did have two Frogadiers in his hand. Not the end of the world. Normally you would like to leave one Froakie there just so that you have the option to bubble if you uh, end up feeling like that's necessary. But in this circumstance, you'd rather have the four Frogadiers out because you can always just get another Froakie to bubble with later. Absolutely, and uh, one thing that is actually quite significant, uh, significant in this matchup, and we should point out, is that Wimpod has 70 HP. 70 HP, which means that he can't, he'll force uh, Michael to use two giant water shurikens to knock out one of those Wimpods. Um, normally, in this case, I mean, we saw yesterday uh, Pokemon with, um, you know, a dish, I think there was that Pikachu that he was playing against that had the rainbow energy, which obviously gave one damage counter, and then obviously used giant water to knock it out. In this case, uh, unless uh, one, uh, one damage counter goes down on that Wimpod, he will have to, you know, use two giant water shurikens to knock that out. Yeah, maybe if he was playing against uh, Golisopod or Garbodor, he would have been able to do that because, of course, that deck plays rainbow energy but Todd does not Todd is only playing three grass energy and four double colorless so yeah absolutely he will, have a, he will either have to deal with those when they become Golisopods or if he wants to deal with them on the bench he will have to do di two di water shurikens instead going back to Todd's turn we do see he has an ultra ball there he's already got one Golisopod on the bench that's going to be great for him and with that ultra ball it looks like he's going to be eyeing up a Zorak I imagine probably to do one of these first few trade abilities and mm. uh, try and dig for that float zone so you can promote that Golisopod do the first impression and pick up the first knockout of the game Absolutely. And what's very worrying, um, if I'm Michael and I'm looking at this matchup, what I find quite worrying um, looking at Todd's deck is that Michael must know that Todd plays a, a, a decent count. So he plays three Acer Roller in his deck. So Acer Roller, any damage that he puts on with something like Giant Water Shuriken, Todd is going to be able to use Acer Roller to pick up that Pokemon and uh, completely you know, reverse that damage. And uh, not to mention... 
that uh, obviously um, he runs four puzzle of time as well, so he can recover those acerola. And um, I think effectively, when you use all of your puzzle times, uh, puzzle of times, and acerola, you've got there like uh, I think seven, seven outs to getting acerola, which is going to be really effective in this matchup. And there is the Guzma. There is bringing up the Frogadier. Um, it doesn't really matter which Frogadier. Obviously, you'd ideally want the one with the energy, but it does force the uh, the change there in Pokemon from Michael's side. But the main thing is that it gets Golisopod into the active spot, and it deals 120 damage with the first impression attack, obviously applying weakness, which is then doubled. Yeah, that's actually quite important as well, because looking over towards this one more time, he actually does not play Floatstone, so he actually needs to use an Acerola or a Guzma if he wants to switch to Glyce Spot to trigger that extra first impression damage. Right, that's, so that could be uh, extremely crucial, actually. Uh, but the good thing is that, uh, as you say, if he gets another Glyce out, uh, he can just use another Guzma, go back into the uh, Glyce There is a Sycamore from Michael Longside, or the other option would be to go with the double colour synergy and uh, try to perhaps either use Crossing Cut GX or even use Armor Press. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, with the Armor Press, there, not only would that is another way of him being able to one-shot a Greninja break without having to do the switching, but again, the Armor Press, the effect of the attack reduces any damage Glyspot takes next turn by 20, which will be, make it a bit more of a struggle for Michael to actually pick up KOs on it. Mm. I think from Michael's side, what could be quite important at this moment in time is getting those Splash Energy onto, um, those, uh, onto those Greninjas, because obviously when it is knocked out, he could then just pick up his Greninja and then obviously place it back down on his Frogadiers on the bench. Uh, so that could be quite, uh, I think, an important card at this moment in time. What I would say, though, with that is I do believe that uh, Tord plays Enhanced Hammer. So he plays two Enhanced Hammer, so that does make it susceptible in that regard. And obviously, you know, he has the Parcel of Time, which means he has more outs to Enhanced Hammer should he need to. Um, interestingly, he goes with the Tapu Fini GX. So I'm not sure what Michael's thinking at this point. Is he suggesting that perhaps he does have the Splash Energy in hand? Is he thinking that perhaps he's going to use his GX attack on that Golisopod? I'm not sure if he necessarily would want to use it on a Goliath spot, although if that's the only threat and he feels like he wants to deal with it straight away, that could be an option. He could, if he has access to a Guzma, he might want to think about uh, getting rid of that uh, Zorog GX with the... Uh with the, the Tapu Storm, because then that would deny Tord of more draw options. Maybe if he feels that Tord doesn't have access to another supporter and that will sort of just slow him down for a few turns, that could be a way to go. But I think he'd just rather have access to it because maybe at some point there will be a big threat of some kind and he'd rather have the option to Tapu Storm than not, if that makes sense. Absolutely, yeah. Very well said. And it's interesting, actually, uh, when Tord went for his first Bridget, I mean, I, Tord is, uh, you know, s such an accomplished player in his own right. Uh, obviously, he knows what he's doing in this matchup, but he has chosen to go with the Tapu Coco and not chosen to put down any more Zoroas. In the, at this point, uh, which obviously would give him more access to things like uh, Zoroark GX and then use Trade. Perhaps he's just thinking, you know, he doesn't want to concede too many uh, GX prizes at this point because obviously when they're knocked out, it does, um, you know, give up. Oh, there is the GX attack. Uh, there is uh, Tapu Storm GX and into the deck that Golisopod goes. Um, so it'll be interesting to see now what he promotes. Uh, it will probably be the Tapu Coco just because obviously it does have that free retreat, which would then allow him to switch back into Golisopod. Yeah, absolutely. So at this point, Tord is just, gonna, is just thinking to himself, I just want to find another Golisopod to replace him on the Josh Shuffle the Way and the Grass Energy. Then I can at least do some damage to this Tapu Fini. Of course, the one important thing about Tapu Fini, like all the uh, Tapu GX cards, <laughs> is that, of course, they do not have weakness. So normally, Water Pokemon would be weak to grass, but the Tapu Fini does not have that. So even with a Choice Band and uh, bringing up the Glyspot into the active, first impression would do 150. would not be enough to pick up the knockout on the Tapu Fini. Absolutely. He does play the one Tapu Lele GX as well. Obviously, that's predominantly used for one's attack, but if he wants to, he could attack with that. And exactly as you were just saying, Nick, uh, they don't have weaknesses. So that could be a factor because that won't uh, get one-shotted by Golisopod, um, assuming he is only going down the first impression route. Um, he is using trade there. He's not playing the Ace Roller. He doesn't have any damage counters on his Pokemon. Oh, and what does Have have? Oh, there is a Golisopod. There is, is the energy. It is a perfect draw for Tord. Able to and find the Golisopod, the... exactly. And he has the Guzma as well. Wow. So he could use that to bring up one of the Greninjas and knock it out with first impression. What a huge draw that was. And there goes a the Greninja, which means that... Um, Michael will only have access to one Greninja break next turn. He will be able to, you know, if he finds means to... I think, actually, he has one Greninja in his prizes. So I think... I'm not sure how many Greninja he has left in his deck. It is important to note that Tord did have access to that move regardless because he did have an Ultra Ball in his hand. But, I see. It, but instead, he was using the trade and discarding Nesa early, he was able to find that Glyspod without using the Ultra Ball. So therefore, he was able to preserve more resources in his hand. And then he had the Guzma, of course, to make the maximum use of that Glyspod and KO that other Greninja. Yeah, an absolutely great play from Tord. Yeah, and uh, I think Michael has the end in hand now. Um, he, yeah, what... Just trying to think, what is the best play at this point? And that, as is, as mentioned, that splash energy is quite crucial. There is the end. So Tord is going for four cards. Michael will go for the six. Um, 
this splash energy, I think, could be uh, quite important because he will be able to put that Frogadier back down. Um, it's a shame that he doesn't have a Frogadier already out because then he can go into Greninja. But he is guaranteed at this moment in time at least one Greninja break, um, you know, should he have access to finding it. Uh, but let's see what he draws here. Yeah, absolutely. Meanwhile, from Todd's side, I feel like he's obviously taken a really good early position in his game. He's been able to do constant first impressions. He's picked up the first two knockouts, and this is exactly what you need to do to beat Greninja. Greninja is a sort of deck that punishes your opponent's deck when they miss tempo. If you miss 1k at any point, they, then they have all that set up, and they're ready to make that huge comeback and just uh, take the game from there. Todd is not missing a beat currently, and this carries on. Todd will be in a very good position to win this game. Absolutely, and uh, that's exactly what is happening here. Todd is not allowing Michael any room to breathe here. There is the break form, um, but he is not allowing any you know room to maneuver Todd is consistently just finding means of knocking out these uh, you know really applying the pressure on Michael Long here there is the choice band so he does have the one energy in hand which he's going to use with um, with giant water shuriken there is 60 damage on the Goliath pod he has an Evo soda in hand uh, an Evo soda in hand um, I don't believe he can use it this turn because the Froki has just hit the bench um, there is damage to the Goliath pod so it forces a Guzma at this point if he wants to get that Goliath spot out of the active spot and then onto the bench which he can then retreat with the Tapu Koko and uh, put back into the active spot which would hit the first impression damage. And one important thing to note we can tell by the amount of damage placed on that uh, Michael opted to use Shadow Stitching so this uh, is going to put Todd in a bit of a spot because he will not be able to use the Zorax trade ability to, do, to draw two extra cards and right. I'm fairly sure that means that he won't have access to Guzma because I did not see one in his hand already. Right and Shadow Stitching is such a crucial attack um, a really powerful attack within this uh, Greninja deck we saw how powerful it was yesterday um, when he was playing against that, uh, that Heatmore or Raichu deck when he was consistently using Shadow Stitching to stop things like Paralysis from Raichu. And we can see it here again. He's using that Shadow Stitching and Todd does rely on abilities. He does have that Zoroark. That is a draw engine within his deck. There is the Bridget. What is he going to search here with the Bridget? I imagine he'll probably be opting to go for another Wimpod and another Zora, which is exactly what he's going to do. <laughs> he wants to just have more of his main, the main strategy of his deck out. He wants to have access to another Zorark. He wants to be, have access to multiple Glyzopods so when one goes down, he can, can keep attacking and he can keep up that tempo, which we mentioned is also crucial in this matchup. What was a really smart play there from Todd, actually? And this is uh, what we talk about, small, intricate plays that make uh, good players great players, which is that he used the Brooklet Hill to search through his deck, try and work out what's in there first. There is no search for Todd in there. He doesn't have any water Pokemon or any fighting Pokemon. Pokemon, um, but he used that information to find out what was in his deck and uh, to work out what Pokemon he could search with Bridget, then hit this, uh, the Bridget, which then allowed him to search for that uh, Zoroa and Wimpod, uh, comfortably knowing that they're both in the deck. Yeah, and it, and it means that you don't have to spend as much time in the early turns of looking through. Obviously, you want to do a quick deck search to look at what's prized at the beginning of the game, but especially in the Swiss rounds, maybe less so in the top cut runs when you have more time, you are time limited and you want to just g gain a quick glimpse of yeah, what's available and then just carry on with the rest of the game. With, with uh, doing it this way around, it means that Todd can just you know, save those thinking points till later, using the Brooklet Hill to work that out and just on the spot when he actually needs to and then make the decision as you just said. Absolutely, and uh, I think uh, Michael is actually going for the KO here. He might actually have KO on the, there is the, uh, the Evo Soda. He's going for another break here, another Greninja break. Uh, does he have a, he does have it in the deck because we can see his prizes there. Um, there are no Greninja breaks in the prizes, uh, in, in his prize cards there. There is, you can see he's put it on the top of his deck. He's just uh, doing, as we were just saying with Todd, looking through his deck, trying to gain information about the contents of, which, uh, of what is inside his deck. He is going for that break form, which means that subject to having two water energy, he will have uh, two giant water shurikens here, which he could knock out uh, a lot of Pokemon in this case. That's, sh that's shadow stitching really putting him work. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And now if it's from Todd's side, this is where you have to be worried about where you, where you are in terms of the tempo of the game. Michael's going to pick up a couple, some KOs here. And after that, Todd really needs to start finding uh, some uh, double colors energy in order to you know, carry on. Or, maybe, or even just another Glycopod so that he can attack with the, with the Wimpod. It's going to be really tricky for him to keep up otherwise. I think a good play from Michael's side, actually. If he giant water shurikens, the, and as I said, this is why the, the Wimpod having 70 HP is quite crucial. But if he targets the Wimpod on the bench, he knocks out that Wimpod. And then if he's able to get a KO on that Golisopod in the active spot just by attacking, um, that would be enough to prevent Todd 
from having a Golisopod GX the following turn, which means that he wouldn't be able to then knock out, um, obviously promoting the Tapu Koko, and then retreating back into a Golisopod to then knock out uh, a Greninja Break in the, pr in the process. Yeah, he would need to find a few more energy to do that. We need to see him benching the Tapu later, using the one attack ability, will find himself the Professor Sycamore, because he, if, he does, if he decides to go for that route, he will need to find an energy to Water Shuriken with, and then another one to attach to the Bench Greninja, because if he wants to use the other Water Shuriken ability, he will of course need to retreat into that other Greninja Break. So He's going to need to find quite a few energy here in order to do that, but he has got the Sycamore, so you'll there see what he gets. Uh, Professor Sycamore, seven new cards from Michael Long. What does he draw from these, uh, these seven new cards? There is one energy. I don't believe he has enough. Yeah, he doesn't have enough to make that play, which is very unfortunate, because that would, I think, put Michael in the driving seat of this match. He has only, He's only found the one, and... That's why the, the Wimpod, having that 70 HP is so crucial in this matchup because now Michael is worried about, you know, should he pass turn? Is he going to have access to a Golisopod? Because all he needs is that Golisopod because he already has the Wimpod on the bench. He already has the Grass Energy and that Tapu Koko is going to become active. So now um, Michael has to worry about that. So what is he going to do here? He's using the Rescue Stretcher probably to recycle some Pokemon, uh, knowing that this Greninja might possibly get, out, uh, get knocked out the following turn. And this is where that Starmie being prized becomes really annoying for him because I imagine if the, it was actually available to him he probably would have uh, considered uh, you know, setting up a Staryu early on and then getting out the Starmie so he could use Space Big and have consistent access to Absolutely. energy but unfortunately that's not available to him so he's been forced to work with what he's been able to draw off these Sycamores and right now he's clearly not being able to draw enough. Absolutely, it's a very valid point there and uh, he could have searched out the uh, the Staryu with Brooklet Hill. Um, evidently he's known, uh, he knows that uh, the Starmie is in his prizes because he's uh, you know done his uh, deck check for the game but uh, yeah, let's see what he does here. It'll be very interesting to see what the play is that he's going for here. He does have the, um, the Frogadier on the bench, which means that he can get a Greninja. He is still one away from a Greninja break. But um, let's see, what does he have? What is he working with here? Is that a Skylar in his hand? So um, that Frogadier was actually just evolved this turn by oh. Evo Soda. So he won't be able to evolve it into a Greninja this turn, but he will be able to next turn. There goes a the Giant Water Shuriken. Going to put six damage counters onto the Glyspot and then following up with a Shadow Stitching to knock it out. Very, very, uh, you know, great. I think probably the best thing that he could have done at that moment in time was to use that shadow stitching attack which is a, a very good play from Michael Longside um, he is now at least guaranteeing that um, you know Todd doesn't have access to things like trade and he you know limiting his chances of getting that Golisopod is that an N in Todd's hand is that what I saw uh, it's very difficult to see because his hand is slightly off camera um, let's see there is a Zoroark so he does have a stand in should he uh, want to use that um, Let's see, what he, what is that that he's got in his hand he's just about to put down? There is the end. So, yes, he has opted to use the end. He's going to be going for four cards here. He needs uh, that Golisopod, really, to, to follow up and apply pressure to Michael. And this is where the Shadow Stitch is going to really hurt him because one of the normal advantages of playing end in a deck like this is that even when you do end yourself down to a low a lower hand size, you know, four, three, two, or even one, you have access to this, you know, trade ability as Zoroark mm -hmm. to draw into more cards and find what you need. If But uh, in this circumstance, because those abilities are unable to be used, if Todd doesn't find exactly the double colorless to, to attack the Zoroark or the um, Glycopod to attack with that, then he's going to be in a really bad shape here, and he might end up falling too far behind in tempo to keep up with this constant stream of giant water shurikens. Absolutely, and it's a very good point that you've mentioned there. He did put down the Zoroark, which we haven't really seen too much from uh, Todd over the course of this weekend, especially not on stream anyway, uh, seeing that Zoroark. Um, let's see what he's got in his hand, um, because that allows him to, as you say, use Mind Jack, and which would get the KO on this Greninja break here. I don't think he's hit either the... the oh, he's got the Glycopod. He has put that down. Yeah, he was wow. able to hit the Glycopod off at the end, so this, uh, that's at the very least you know, sort of the thing he needed in uh, you know, either for that or the double colours to attack with uh, one of the other two. But he is, is able to find that, so that's going to be great for him. He's going to be able to bring it up and take the knockout onto this uh, Greninja, but looks like he's opting, deciding whether to go for a Grass Energy on the Glycopod. Uh, instead, that would be quite interesting because that, that would mean he'd only be one extra grasp and attachment away from being able to use armor press, exactly, and then yeah. that way he wouldn't need to worry about constantly switching in order to get the extra damage of first impression, to, but still able to knock out Greninja breaks. Absolutely, and uh, armor press would gain a knockout on these Greninja breaks because they only do have 170 HP. Um, with weakness, those armor press will be uh, dealing 200 damage total, which is a knockout on those Greninja breaks. Uh, but as you say, debating whether to put down that grass energy to have access um, to that uh, armor press for next turn which would force him, which would ease the pressure of him not having to find a double colorless energy for the following turn.
And also, as you say, if Michael does opt to again use Shadow Stitching, um, that would um, you know, restrict him from using his abilities, which means he won't be able to use things like Trade. So that is the reason why you can see Todd here opting to put down that extra Grass Energy to give him access to finding just one more Energy card, which would give him access to that Armor Press. Yeah, it means he can find either Double Colorless or Grass and still be able to keep the stream of attackers. There goes the KO onto the Greninja Break. And more importantly, as you mentioned earlier, Jamie, that Splash Energy was still committed to the Greninja Break. So Michael will be able to put all those pieces of the evolution line back into his hand and I imagine we're going to see them both get swiftly put back down <laughs> evolving these two as has yes. just happened. Yeah, and I, I mean that is such a, a crucial part to this deck really here. If you're getting one-shotted every turn then Splash Energy really does put in a lot of work in this deck. Uh, you can see Michael there, you know, looking at... Um, you know, looking at his deck, he's thinking about Star You here because obviously you do need to stream, you know, um, constantly stream those uh, Star You, uh, well, Star Me, and constantly keep streaming uh, Giant Water Shuriken here. So he is going for that Star You, but unfortunately for Michael, his Star Me is in the prizes. And subject to, you know, if he takes another knockout here, he might draw it out of his prizes depending on which prize he chooses to go. With, uh, he chooses to go with. So there is the Choice Band. There is a Giant. Uh, sorry, the Water Energy. What is he going to do here? Is he just going to go for a, sh uh, a Shadow Stitching? No, he's going for a Moonlight Slash for 110, wow. deciding that he wants to be able to make it more likely that he's able to pick up the two-shot next turn. And, Absolutely. Uh, but uh, now it's going to be on Tord. If he's able to find an Ace of Roller, this would be the perfect timing for something like that. I'm not sure if he did, although he, unlike in the previous few turns, because Michael Long did Moonlight Slash, Tord does have access to trade this turn. So he could discard something with his hand, gain access to two more cards, and uh, I imagine he'll probably be discarding... Actually, I'm not sure from his hand. That's a bit of an ugly decision. I think uh, there's a, I saw a part of the time I saw a Professor Sycamore. What is that? Is that it's a Wimpod. What's the, 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 there's one card that he's got in his hand that I can't work out what it is. There's, I believe there's a Mallow, a Professor Sick and more, a Puzzle of Time, and the Wimpod there. So sure. he's going to go for the Brook at the Hill first. Again, just garnering that information. What do I have left? You know, just reminding himself of uh, what he has access to in order to determine what are the probabilities that if I go for this uh, trade, that I actually hit what I need. Absolutely, yeah. So a uh, very smart play from Todd's side there, you know, trying to gain information from his deck, uh, just trying to go through, and obviously he does need the energy for the knockout. As you say, he can't use any of the supporters in his hand if he is opting to try and get Acerola in this case. Acerola would be so fantastic for Todd here. I think that would uh, more or less kind of, you know, edge him very near to winning this game just because it's just so crucial uh, at this point. An important thing to note about Acerola as well is that he essentially has two outs to it. He can either draw one of his remaining Acerolas, or since there's one already in the discard pile, if he were to draw a Puzzle of Time, that would also be a means of him being able to recover an Acerola That's true, and yeah. uh, do it that way. But instead, it looks like he's opting to play the Mallow. Wow. So he, uh, let's see what he goes with the Mallow. I'd be very interested to see what he goes with his. There is the Puzzle of Time. So he has one Puzzle of Time in hand, which means that he will be able to recover things from his discard pile. Um, what is going to be his second choice here? Let's see what he goes with. Um, so he's filtering through his deck, his deck here. There is a double colorless energy. So he... He wants to have access to more energy resources for later on because he knows he can you know, quite easily pick up the KO on this Greninja. That's fine. And that's also really good for him because unlike the previous Greninja, this one does not have a splash energy on it. So all those pieces of that Greninja break line will be going to the discard pile once this gets knocked out. But yeah, it looks like Tord is opting to go for the double colors as the second card after all. Sure. Yeah. And uh, it makes sense because, as you say, with the double colors energy, he does af uh, have access to things like, you know, attacking with uh, Zoroark GX, attacking with the, the non-Zoroark, uh, the non-GX Zoroark there with Mindjack. Um, can seeing how um, how many Pokemon that uh, Michael has on his bench will do a hefty amount of damage there. So let's see. Let, what let's see. Hopefully this time the uh, Todd won't look at the top two cards <laughs> of his deck before putting the Mallow cards on top. <laughs> let's have a look. See. Um, what he chooses to go with, and but the other factor is here that if he does concede, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> if he does concede this Golisopod GX here, Michael is only two prizes away from winning the game, and. Yeah, so he's playing, he's discarding the Professor Sycamore. He's not playing the Professor Sycamore. He is discarding it. And as you can see, Michael there confirming with, <laughs> with Tord. Um, there is the Wimpod. That is a huge, huge, um, you know, in this matchup to put that Wimpod down because he needs that to follow up for next turn. Yeah. And, that's, and that's exactly why he did not discard it with the trade. We saw he actually opted to discard the Professor Sycamore off of the trade instead of uh, the Wimpod there because he knows he wants to be able to carry on doing these uh, you know, first impression attacks. And that, there we go. There is the Puzzle of Time opted to go for the Grass Energy and the Ace Roller. There goes the third Grass onto the Golisopod and then he will find a Crossing oh, Cut GX. Wow. So, so Todd decided he wants to make it as hard as possible for Michael uh, to you know, make sure that he doesn't end up 
you know, David that guy's pod KO'd. So preserving it, using the crossing cut, even though the armor press would have picked up the KO regardless, he wants to make sure that he has the maximum chance possible of being able to do a follow-up attack. So using the crossing cut just for the switching effect to preserve it onto the bench. It's a very, very smart play from Tord's side there. And as you say, um, Michael will have access to a giant water shuriken, but I don't think that will be knockout on the Goliathopod, which is on the bench just yet. So that is on 110 damage. So... Uh, putting the 60 on will take it up to 170, which means it's slightly just short there. And looking on towards, uh, on Michael's side, he doesn't have access just yet because he's only got the, uh, the Frogadier on the bench. He will need to evolve that Frogadier into Greninja and then go into Greninja Break. So it is quite tricky here from Michael uh, from Michael's side because you know he doesn't have access to knocking out that Golisopod. He could opt to play something like a Guzma, maybe. He could go, um, if he has maybe Guzma, Energy, and uh, there is a break. So, as you say, if he has Guzma, Energy, and um, and the, the Greninja, he could just opt to not concede the... Um, oh, Beggy Party doesn't play Guzma. Of course he doesn't play Guzma. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, tricky here for Michael. What does he do? What does he... You know, because that goal is just going to come out and... Um, you know, take the KO again, especially with the Tapu Koko having free retreats. Uh, what is the the optimum play here? There is the the Tapu Fini GX going in the active spot. That's exactly why Todd would have done a crossing cut GX as well. At this stage of the game, they will know, you know, almost to a near perfect 60 exactly what cards are in people's lists. So if Todd was, was as aware as he probably should be that Michael was not playing Guzma, then he knows that crossing cut would mean that it would be out of range for KO and be safe on the bench. Absolutely, yeah. So he's just opting, you know, deciding what should I put active here. He could yeah, try and play the seven. Well, uh, he's not knocking out any. Um, he hasn't knocked out any non-GX Pokemon here, but that Staryu is going active. Uh, it doesn't really have much use at the moment, just because obviously that uh, Starmie is in the in the in his prize cards. So, so it's important to remind you. So he did use, in fact, use the Aqua Wing attack on the Tapu Fini GX. So does 20 damage and allows him to switch into any bench Pokemon he wishes. Obviously, to switch into the Staryu there and doing 20 damage to the Tapu Koko. Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So let's see what Todd goes with here. Um, there is the choice band. So not really doing too much here. I think um, maybe just to kind of seal out the game um, if he wants to go down the route of knocking out that um, Tapu Fini. But he has used his GX attack for the game. There is the Field Blower getting rid of the Brooklet Hill. Um, I don't believe that Todd has... Well, if he has outs to winning this game... It's just the unfortunate thing from uh, on this uh, from turn, Todd's yeah. side is that, as you already mentioned, he, he's already used his Jax attack to sort of preserve that Goliath spot and make right. sure it doesn't get knocked out. So he won't be able to you know, take a knockout on a Fini or, or, a, or a Tapu Lele with crossing cuts. But at this point, I almost don't think it even matters. He, you see that he's able to pick up another KO on the Staryu with the Zorark. And Michael's just in bad shape here. He's got one Greninja break left to work with. But there's an Evo Soda. He might be able to find himself another Greninja off of that. There indeed it goes. But I think at this point, it's just too little too late. Greninja can make incredible comebacks. We've seen, make, seen them happen before. But at this point, that the Glycepod is not going to go down this turn, and it's just sitting there, be too able to you know, KO any threat that Michael can put out. Absolutely, and as you just said, he has just played that Evo Soto to evolve that Greninja. So that means he will only have access to maximum um, one, um, one giant water shuriken here. So he won't be able to take a knockout on that Glycepod that is sitting on the bench. Um, it could be... I mean, you know, Tor does play a heavy count of Guzma in this deck, but could a stall tactic be, you know, worth trying to implement here. I mean, that Zoroark has a two retreat cost. Unless Tord has a float stone or a double colors energy, he might not be able to get it out of the active spot, which would allow enough time for Michael to use his giant water shurikens and potentially try and knock out the Golisopod. Well, again, Tord doesn't play float stone, so it would have to be a Guzma if Michael were to go for that. But again, Michael doesn't play Guzma, so that's not an option either. <laughs> yes, absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, that could be his only option here at this moment in time, is to try and hope that Tord doesn't have access to trying to get the Zorok out of the active spot. Um, in which case, um, yeah, so he's just going to retreat. Um, he's going for the Aqua Ring again, yeah. so he'll do 20 damage. Yeah, is he opting to switch, though? That's the question. Oh, no, he's actually leaving. He said leave, opting to leave active. Oh, said. okay. So... It looks like uh, there goes the trade from, um, from Todd's side. He's guarding the bridge. They're going to draw two cards. Looks like he finds himself an Enhanced Summer. He could use that to discard Splash Energy off of the Tapu Fini, which it does indeed do, but um, he wasn't able to find the switching out just yet. He wasn't able to find a Double Colorless or a Guzma. So there goes a Field Blower onto the Brooklet Hill. 
And after that, he looks like he might just be forced to... I'm not sure if there's a, a support from Tan. There is an Acer Roller, and that's exactly why Michael opted actually to, look, to pass and not do the damage with Acarine, because that would have made Acer Roller another out. Right. So instead, okay. he will just use Acer Roller to pick up the Glycopod, just cementing his position even further, and uh, just making sure that even if Michael were able to do a couple of giant water shurikens, that Glycopod would not be KO'd. So at this point, yeah, Tortoise is in a commanding lead here, and Michael just opts to concede. Right, yeah, and uh, as you say, very, very intricate plays here that are making the difference here at the top tables, in the top four, here at the London uh, at uh, the London Excel Arena for the International Championships uh, of Europe. Um, as we were just talking about there, Nick, um, you know, you, you touched on a very, very interesting and valid point there. He chose not to put damage onto that Zoroark because then Acer Roller would then be uh, a target for him to pick up that uh, Pokemon. But, um, you know, there's still plenty of time here for Michael um, to try and get back into this game. It is going to be very tough, um, not just because of the deck that um, you know that he's up against, but also the player that he's up against. You know, Todd has been in this situation so many times before, and he's you know come out on top on so many different occasions. So it is going to be very difficult for Michael, but we'll be very interested to see how this uh, this final match plays out. I think if you. you compare, I, I, we'd have to run some sort of statistics checks on this, but I believe that actually out of uh, all of the players in the Masters Division, Todd has had the most high finishes out of, uh, out of any Masters Division player in, across the international championships that have happened. Of course, we saw he got the top four at uh, the European International Championships last year and able to win the North American International Championships. Mm -hmm. Right, so I mean, when it comes to, um, to high stakes, Todd is certainly no stranger to these, uh, you know, to these big events and getting so far into the tournament. And as you can see, you know, taking game one, this is just, I mean, this is just nothing new for Todd, is it? I mean, he just comes to these big scale tournaments, does so well, and uh, this is exactly what he's doing here. He could, you know, obviously, you know, progress. If he wins this, this game now, he'll progress to the final, which will be the top two of this, uh, of this European International um, Championships. But yeah, I mean... You know, there's still plenty of time to go. Michael could still, you know, claw this one back. You know, we'll have to wait and see how this plays out. Yeah, so from, from Michael's side there, Todd was able to stabilize too much. He was able to get out too many glycopods. His attacking stream was too quick. And then at a later point, uh, Michael realized that he, he shouldn't attack with anything. The things that he could attack with were too weak, and they were able to KO'd, be KO'd too easily by Todd. And so he was just stuck doing, doing aqua rings and you know, really suboptimal plays just to keep himself in the game. And so uh, that's the point where Michael realized it just wasn't worth carrying on and carrying on to game two instead. But it looks like um, Todd has actually has a less than optimal start, and he's actually been, has to start with the uh, Mewtwo from uh, Evolution. It's not ideal for him at all. No, and uh, one thing that we should point out, actually, which I think is uh, very important is that uh, despite the fact that Michael lost the first game, obviously he will be going first, so he can evolve his Pokemon quicker and use those uh, those uh, water duplicates. I don't think from watching Michael play that he's really put a foot wrong in this match. He's made every optimal play that he, he can possibly do. Um, he has, you know, weighed out every situation and made the best possible plays that he can. And so, you know, credit to Michael for, for you know, doing so well to get to here and evidently you can see why he's so good at this game there is the Froakie so he's starting Froakie active which is uh, probably your, your ideal starter in this case um, there goes the prizes uh, they're just being laid down let's try and have a look at the prizes and see um, if we can spot anything in there that is significant so from Tord's side he has two Zoroark GX in there yeah, yeah, indeed, two Zorak plus an Acerola, not going to be ideal for him. But then from Michael's side as well, we see he does has prized one Frogadier. Not the, not the worst, but at the same time, not ideal. You want to get out as many Frogadiers as possible, so you would be looking to... Thankfully, it is you know, near the bottom of his prizes, so as long as he takes an early knockout on something, you'll be able to fish that out and evolve into a Froakie. But yeah, no, prizing more than zero Frogadier is always a bit of a sad sight when you're playing Greninja. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And uh, one thing that he does have access to, which is one thing that he had a shortage of in the previous game, was... Um, he will, not, uh, will now have access to that Starmie, which has a Space Beacon ability, which will allow him to get back energy from his discard pile and constantly stream those giant water shurikens. Yeah, meanwhile, from Todd's side, we do see, in spite of the uh, not so great starting Pokemon he has to deal with, he was, a was able to draw a Wimpod for his turn, and now he did have access to the Bridget in his hand already so, as well. So he'll be able to use that to get out another Wimpod, get out a couple of Zoras, maybe even Tapu Koko if he wants to have the mobility with that. So just generally off to a really good start. Absolutely, and uh, you can see the, the, how crucial that Tapu Koko is in the deck, just because, not you know, mostly because you attack with it, but just because it has free retreat, and 
you just constantly switch from that into your Golisopod GX, which is why uh, Todd puts a big emphasis on having that Tapu Koko in his deck. Um, as you can see there, there are two Zorok GXs in the prizes. There is one Tapu Lele, and on Michael's side, you do have the one Frogadier, which certainly could be crucial um, you know, when trying to set up. He will, you know, assumingly when he starts taking prizes, if he takes prizes from the bottom, uh, he will have access to trying to get that uh, Frogadier out of his prizes very shortly. Yeah, so meanwhile, from towards side, uh, after the Bridget, it was, I'm not sure, the one problem he has, I'm not sure if I saw an energy in the sand, if he did, I think he has one grass energy, so he'll probably commit that to the wind pod, and then after that, we'll probably just see a pass, and it goes back to Michael. It'll be interesting to see if he actually has access to water duplicates this turn or not. I didn't get quite get a good look at his hand, but it looks like, no, there it is, he's uh, flipping up now. He does have a water energy in his hand, I believe he has an N, so okay. he'll have to rely on drawing the, uh, the Frogadier off of that if he wants to water duplicates this next turn. There is the field blower that is, uh, you know, removing the, the Brooklet Hill. That is uh, quite crucial to Michael in terms of setting up his, um, you know, if he wants to get Tapu Fini GX out or if he wants to get out his Staryu. Uh, there is another Brooklet Hill, so it doesn't matter anyway. Um, and it's uh, deck thinning uh, in the process as well, which is great if he does decide to go down uh, the route of playing that end. But you can see he's putting emphasis here on that Staryu. He's evidently just, uh, you know, Search his deck to work out. Um, there is an Ultra Ball in hand as well, so he will have access to a um, to using a uh, well to getting a Frogadier out, which will get him the Water Duplicates attack and searching out his Frogadiers. And as you can see, he has uh, you know when he was um, searching through his deck, working out how many Frogadiers were in there. He does have access to. Um, just the two Frogadiers because one is in his prizes at the moment. So um, that's information that Tord will gather on his side. He will acknowledge that, okay, he's only got three, um, you know, Frogadiers out at the moment, which means he doesn't have access to that third uh, Greninja or that Greninja break when he eventually gets to it. So, um, yeah, but um, all in all, a very good setup, you'd have to say, from Michael's side. Yeah, meanwhile, back to Tord, yeah, as we do see. He does draw into another Zora for his turn, but actually I'm not sure if I see any kind of draw supporter in his hand. Wow, yeah, here's a Guzma. But the Guzma doesn't really help him that much. No, I mean, it, I gets mean, the, it gets the Mewtwo out of the active, but he doesn't actually have anything to follow up and attack with. Wow, um, yeah, I mean, and as, as you say, he does... Okay, there goes the um, Guzma for the um, for the Froakie, trying to maybe stall out uh, Michael here. But is that... It looked... Oh, okay, so he's literally just going for the flying flip here, just to try and put some damage counters onto... Um, onto Michael's side. He doesn't really have too much to work with here. I thought, uh, that I think he has an Enhanced Hammer in hand. Uh, I thought that was an Ultra Ball. It's not. I'm pretty sure it's an Enhanced Hammer. So, yeah, this could be Michael's opening. This could be what he needs to get himself back into the game. Yeah, he absolutely could. I mean, Flying Flip and everything as well doesn't really make a huge difference with what uh, Michael has out now. If um, if Michael had put out a Tapafini, then it would have made a bit of a difference because that would have brought the Tapafini down to 150 HP, which at, at that point, a first impression with a choice band would knock it out. But you know, when Tord sets up his uh, Golisopods, he's knocking out things uh, in one shot anyway. So Flying Flip, I'm not sure if it'll actually, you know, come, actually come to help him that much unless he's forced to attack with Zorark. I think um, having... Let's just look at Michael's hand here. Did he just get that Tapu Lele G... Is that what he just drew, Tapu Lele GX? Because last turn, Michael opted to discard with the Ultra Ball, I think the Professor Sycamore. Now he's thinking to himself, you know, he's looked at Tord and saying to himself, you know, okay, there is another Professor Sycamore. So that was a very, very good top deck there from Michael getting that Tapu Lele GX because he does not want to end uh, Tord at this point. He does not want to give him access to um, potentially drawing into something that is going to help him. So uh, very, very fortunate there for Michael. But uh, so he does hit the Sycamore, um, draws seven cards. There is the Evo Soda. So he will have access to getting out a Greninja this turn. Does he have... There is the Evo Soda, so he will be going for a Greninja. He doesn't have any uh, Frogadiers as a target here because the last Frogadier is in his in his prize cards. There... I mean, how does he get that... Um, that Froki, or yeah, that Froki out of the active spot this turn to attack with his Greninja? I don't believe he can. He can just attach Water Energy and retreat? Yes, that, that, but... That's something he can do? He can, but he won't be able to attack with the Greninja. Uh, he he the, will, there's, uh, the one Greninja already has Water oh, Energy Oh, I beg your pardon, I missed that. So yes, he does have the... Um, the one energy on the Greninja, which means that he will be able to follow that up with an attack. If he doesn't get the knockout on this Tapu Koko, that Tapu Koko could, with Flying Flip, KO that Staryu. So I'm surprised that um, Michael hasn't made more of an emphasis to uh, potentially try and preserve that Staryu and uh, evolve it into a Starmie. But let's see if he has the... I don't believe he does have the knockout here on that Tapu Koko. I mean, if he wanted to 
not evolved to Staryu, but have a chance of preserving it so that it can evolve to Sami. One option you could have done is to, to bubble instead of retreating, but it looks like that's not, not what he's opted to go for instead. Obviously for the Shadow Stitching to try and reduce the number of outs that Todd has to draw out of this, so now Zoroark will not help him if he is able to draw that. He can evolve the Zoroark, sure, but he won't be able to use a trade ability to draw two more cards. Absolutely, and here you can see the power of that Greninja deck um, using Shadow Stitching, which is uh, kind of a, a, a resemblance in some ways to what Hex Maniac used to do before it got rotated. Um, it is preventing Todd from not using abilities, um, so in this case he won't be able to use Zoroark's, uh, which he does heavily rely on to draw out of things, you know, out of these kind of situations that he's, uh, that he's in. So In this circumstance it's not going to matter too much though, because I mean, look at Todd's hand, he has got nothing to work with. There <laughs> goes the uh, Flying Flare, but he's able to pick up a KO on the Staryu, going to rack up some more damage on the rest of Todd's field, and again, that 20 damage on the Tapu Lele GX is actually quite relevant because that will now be in range for a first impression with a Choice Band 150 for a knockout, but... Yeah, it's a really unfortunate situation for Todd. I'm, I'm not sure what he's able to pull out of his prizes just there, but I don't believe it was a draw supporter. Absolutely. And uh, there goes the Greninja break. Um, Todd, uh, sorry, Michael has actually just got that Super Rod. So if he wants to um, use Super Rod at this moment in time, put that Staryu back in the deck and then use Brooklet Hill, that could certainly be a play that Michael might be thinking about here. Um, he does have the option of using Giant Water Shuriken here, um, which he is just contemplating. That Giant Water Shuriken won't be a knockout on that Tapu Koko, but one thing he could potentially do is use that Giant Water Shuriken on Tapu Koko, which he's going to do, and then follow up again with another Shadow Stitching, which would uh, continue to lock Tord out of using abilities and using things like Zoroark uh, GX for its trade ability. Yeah, and, I'm, and it look, I imagine that's what Michael will probably be going for, unless... It looks like he's debating attaching the Splash Energy. It would mean that he has one more energy than he actually needs in order to attack with Greninja. But I think he's worried about Toro just pulling out a Zorok double colorless and taking yeah. a, a knockout on the Greninja. And he doesn't want to lose that whole line he's built up. So even though he has more than one energy attached, it, it's, uh, it's still worth it enough for him because it means that he will uh, preserve that, that evolution line. Absolutely. And uh, you can see Michael does actually, unlike Todd, have a supporter card in his hand. But he is not going to play that supporter card because um, well, <laughs> Michael has actually just taken the Frogadier, which means means he will have access to evolving that Froakie the following turn, but he is opting not to play that supporter card in his hand because he realizes how much of a, a situation that uh, Tord is currently in, and he's not drawing anything to... He has the Puzzle of Time in hand. He could opt to use just a single Puzzle of Time here, rearrange the top three cards of his deck, and potentially find a supporter card next turn, which is what I think he's going to do here. There is a Puzzle of Time. What top three cards does he have? There's, wow, okay. Oh. Not good for Tord. So Tord is sitting on... For the next, you would have to say, three or four turns of not really drawing too much here. Well, no, he's going to try and fix that now. He has to use that Brooklet Hill, right. of course, using okay. that after the Puzzle of Time, just to give his deck another shuffle. Maybe then his, uh, his uh, first uh, draw for turn will be a bit better than those three cards. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, as we're saying, intricate plays. These are you know, the plays that uh, make you know, good players, great players. Uh, so very well spotted there, Nick. Yes, he is using Brooklet Hill here to try and shuffle his deck in hope that he can potentially uh, try and draw a supporter card or something that's going to help him for the following turn. Yeah. Meanwhile, from uh, that for this turn, he, his draw turn was actually a double colorless, so he's probably going to want to hold on to that for now. And obviously, not being, nothing really worthwhile that he can commit it to at this stage in the game, and he's probably just going to be content with uh, well, benching his aura, but then I imagine he will just pass. Yeah. So I think that's pretty much all he can do at this moment in time. Uh, he can't, well, he has a Guzma in hand. Um, he could potentially attack with Mewtwo, but again, that's not really doing too much at this moment in time. Um, let's see, what did, there is the Frogadier um, that he drew, that Michael drew out of his prizes. Let's see, what does he have in his hand here? What did he, he top deck? Um, it's a little bit difficult to see, just because the, uh, his hand is just slightly off camera. Um, what is he looking for here? What is he, he's Brooklyn, using Brooklet Hill here. Um, he must be thinking about going down the route of getting that star you, uh, that star you back out. Or is he choosing not to get Staryu out at this point? I don't believe he was able to recover it into the deck yet. Of course, yes. Yeah, he, had, um, he hasn't used Super Rod yet to put the Staryu back in. Um, which I'm surprised he doesn't make... I mean, obviously he knows uh, a lot better than, than I do as to what, what he's doing in this matchup. But I'm surprised he hasn't made more of an emphasis on getting that out, especially towards like the later game. There's um, a draw for Todd there. It looks to be another Zora. I'm not going to bail him out of this one. Again, might just have to be a pass. That double colorless uh, as he's sitting on that not really providing him any sort of help at all and uh, Tord is just really not seeing good draws here at all. No, absolutely not. Um, so yeah, I mean what you, there's nothing you can do from Tord's side. At this point there's very very little that he has to work with. Um, 
But if you're Michael, you know, you do have to start sweeping up this game soon because there will be a time when Tor does hit something like a Sycamore, does hit something like an Ultra Ball with a Tapu Lele. So you do have to start, you know, really maximizing this opportunity to try and, you know, win this game. So there is the uh, Shadow Stitching. There goes Azorowa into the discard pile. So he won't have access to using um, abilities again. So if he does top deck a Zoroark here, that won't be useful at this moment in time. There is another Guzma he's just drawn there. Again, not going to help him too much here at this moment in time. The problem, uh, I, you say if he drew a Zoroark, it wouldn't be useful. It would be in the sense of at least he'd be able to attack with something. He could just evolve it, attach double color to do rise as beating and maybe pose a threat to this good ninja. As it stands, there goes the uh, Guzma, which he did draw off the top of his deck. Going to bring up the Tapu Lele again, trying to buy himself some more time. Just anything he can do to try and make it more likely that he's able oh, to draw his way N. out of this. Next card was going to be an end, which oh. would have got him out of the situation. You can see there Tord just looking at his deck, uh, trying to work. <laughs> you can see Tord's expression on his face, like, oh, why did I do that? <laughs> uh, but yeah, he uh, he would have had, uh, had access to the end, which is just typical, I suppose. You know, always it's always the next card. But um, I mean, all the same, though. I mean, Michael's actually not drawing too hot himself right now. He's got, got not got an amazing hand to work with. He do has he does have one supporter in his hand. Um, but I don't believe it's one that will that enables him to draw more cards, or if if that, then it might just be. An, an, it looks like he's drawn another N. I think um, the support card he had in his hand was the N, which he's opting not to play just because he doesn't want to give Tord uh, more access to drawing cards and to eventually set up things like Golisopod. And that's really the biggest threat to this deck at this moment in time. Um, he does have the energy in hand, which will give him the retreat on that Tapu Lele GX. Uh, no, it's not going to be good enough because, of course, this is a splash energy which can only be attached to water Pokemon. Oh, uh, okay. Tapu, of which Tapu Lele is not. Oh, I beg your pardon. I thought I saw a water energy in his hand. Uh, I could be wrong there. Uh, let's have a Oh, it's just just, just the uh, the splash energy. There is the field blower to <laughs> stop Tort looking through his deck. Yeah. Um, and, and just to clarify, there what happened? Michael used the super rod and then used the Brooklet Hill to shuffle to put the star me the star U. He shuffled back in straight onto his bench. Oh, he's playing the N. So now he decides, okay, I just uh, I've run out of patience. I cannot hold fire any longer. I need to just capitalize on this huge advantage I have right now. Even if it does give Tord a new hand, I have enough things set up where I can just take command of the game, even if Tord is able to set up back. Absolutely. And it's good um, using the end being progressive in the sense. So if Michael does hit things like some Greninjas in this case, um, that is kind of being progressive in the sense that if Tord hit something, that would be able to maximize his turn, and then Michael would have to follow that up. But in this case, Michael is using this uh, kind of... You know, putting the step forward, if you like, in this matchup. There's only four cards, no energy at this point. Uh, he has, I was going to say, he could have used the Evo Soda to get the Starmie out at this point, but he has just benched the Staryu this turn, so that is not going to be an option at this moment in time. There goes down the Greninja, so he's going to have at least two Greninja breaks um, if he can get out, if he has access to it, having at least two Greninja breaks for the following turn. But he has to pass turn because that Tapu Lele GX, I think, is just stuck in the active spot. So Tord now, look at Tord's hand. It's, I mean, he has the Professor Sycamore. There goes the, the Field Blower on two choice bands there. I mean, Tord has got a lot to work with here. So finally, he's in a, in a situation where he's going to be able to get things out. Um, he's not, uh, as well as he's not uh, locked. <laughs> there goes the Professor Sycamore. He's not locked out of abilities here because... Um, Michael didn't attack and he didn't have access to using that shadow stitching attack. So he will be able to use things like trades from his Zoroark GX. Um, what did he get in his hand here? If I believe he found one Zoroark and one Golisopod. One sad thing for Tord though is that we did see he actually discarded another Guzma off of a Sycamore, having already played one earlier, which means that again he's running out of outs to actually switch between his things. We've already mentioned he does not play Floatstone, so now it means that he needs to have access to Acerola more than likely if, as another out to switch if he's unable to find his remaining Guzmas, which he'd also rather save for bringing stuff up on the bench regardless. Yeah, and he has used that one puzzle of time, which means that he only has access to three more puzzle of times. There is one puzzle of time in his hand. I don't believe I saw another one in his hand. Um, oh, there's stand-in, which that could be a, uh, a potential out at this point. But as you say, that um, Zoroark would then still need to be uh, retreated in some form or another if he is choosing to go down the route of using that Golisopod. Um, let's have a look. I believe uh, that Tapu Lele GX has... Oh, okay, so he didn't have... Um, oh, there goes the uh, the Eva Soda. I was just thinking, if he had the Double Colors Energy, I believe he would have had Knockout with Mind Jack. Uh, would have got him the Knockout on that Tapu Lele GX. Um, he has, but evidently he didn't hit the uh, Double Colors Energy. There goes Eva Soda. There goes down another Greninja. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, if he he's chosen to go with the Greninja actually instead of the Greninja Break, uh, I don't believe he has any Greninja Breaks in his prizes. So trying to establish a more, um, I guess you can say, a more uh, stronger hold on the game, if you like. So next turn, even if you know one Greninja Break goes down, he does have access to at least two more Greninja Breaks. There is a Rescue Stretcher in hand, another and a Splash Energy as well. There is another Greninja. So Michael is taking a commanding lead in this game. Um, there is you know the. Greninja Break in the active spot. So he does have access to Giant Water Shuriken if he wants to play it. And of course, that Greninja Break does have that Splash Energy. So if it gets knocked out by something like a Golisopod, that will go back into his hand. And then he can re-evolve uh, next turn his Greninja into his Greninja Break. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how the rest of this game goes. So for now, look, those two flying flips that uh, Tor did earlier, the fact that he's able to pull two off means that, again, he's going to have an easier time carrying things with both uh, the Zorox as well as the Golisopods. He doesn't have to rely just on Golisopods to carry things because of those flying flips. But the the problem that Tord has is that Michael just might be able to do too much damage and take his remaining prizes before Tord is able to even capitalize on that. We saw that Michael had a very strong turn there. He was able to retreat the Tapu Lele, able to bring out the Greninja break, did a giant water again on the bench Golisopod, and he's going to put a world of hurt on the Zorak to boot, I imagine, with a shadow stitching so that, again, he just stops Tord from being able to do his set, do stand in, or doing trade. Absolutely, and uh, as you said, it was a very good point there. He is just in quite a commanding position here um, with having his three Greninjas out and obviously the Greninja break. Um, he is using Moonlight Slash, uh, putting the water energy back into his hand, not um, you know choosing to keep the splash energy on that Greninja break, so that if it does get knocked out, he will be able to re-evolve one of his Greninjas into a Greninja break the following turn. Yeah, so there goes the uh, tr the trade. Of oh, enhanced the hammer! Wow, that energy. is a big play. A huge enhanced hammer is able to discard the splash energy off of the Greninja break, and just check it to make sure there's no uh, no remaining <laughs> energies uh, on the Greninja breaks, so that he is able to make this game meaningful. He does have the double colors in his hand, so he could just uh, opt to attach that, discard to retreat, bring up the Glycopod, and pick up the K on this Greninja. Uh, but instead, he's opted wow. to Ace Roller. Really good timing there, able to pick up that Zorak break, the Zorak break, the Zorak um, GX. <laughs> uh, Zorak break is a, is a real card, just uh, not in this, uh, not being used in this deck. And uh, he will be able to use that to heal off that Zorak. And actually, going to opt to attach double colors to the non GX Zorak. And he now will be able to pick up the KO with Mind Jack, a one prize attacker knockout trading with a one prize attacker knockout, which is going to make it a lot better for him. Absolutely. And uh, as you can see here, uh, going with Mind Jack, taking the knockout on that Greninja break, he is not putting that Greninja break back into his hand because there was no uh, splash energy on that Greninja break. Obviously, the issue that Michael has here is that he is four prizes away from winning this game, which means he does need to knock out at least two EX or two GX Pokemon in this case, is because both of them will concede two prizes each, which would give him the magic, four num um, the magic number in four prizes. And obviously, in this case, the thing that Michael has to worry about now is that obviously knocking out that Golisopod or attempting to knock out that Golisopod, um, Tord is going to be constantly reusing things like Acerola over and over and over again just to gain the, the, the first impression, extra damage if you like, and of course to preserve um, the, the Golisopods from being knocked out. And not only that, but we've already mentioned that Michael Long does not play Guzma, so he can't, say for example, do a giant water shuriken and then follow up with a Moonlight Slash to get a Golisopod. He could do maybe two giant water shurikens to the Golisopod on the bench, but then we know that Tord has actually just picked up an Acerola off of his prizes, so unless Michael is able to end that away, Tord, if Michael were to go for the play and do two giant water shurikens onto the Golisopod, would be able to undo all of that and uh, really, really make Michael have a sad time. Right, and I mean, <laughs> the... the um the Acer Roller does two things for you. Not only does it preserve your Golithopod, not only does it prevent your opponent from... There is another Splash Energy, which is a, a big deal, actually. And, well, very, very good play there from Michael. Um, choosing to use Giant Water Shuriken there to put 60 damage on that Zoroark, following up with a Shadow Stitching, which means he won't have access to using uh, abilities, so he won't have access to using Trade on his turn. And uh, acknowledging that he might potentially get knocked out this... Well, he will get... Um, you know, we, we're assuming at this point that he is going to be knocked out from that Golisopod GX. But in the meantime, he has also put a Splash Energy onto that Greninja Break, which means that that Greninja Break will go back into his hand and he will be able to evolve it uh, the following turn because he, just, uh, he has two Greninjas sitting there on the bench waiting to be evolved. Yeah, indeed he does. And uh, meanwhile, from Tord's side, he has the Ultra Ball. And I imagine here, yeah, he will be going for a second Golisopod. And now, if he wants to, he could make use of the Acerola now. It does only heal 60 damage, but that still does make it a lot harder for Michael to follow up with a, with a KO. And it means that the Tord's board will be entirely fresh, as it were. Um, it would be interesting to see if he does decide to go for that now. Uh, 
the one problem, or the one unfortunate thing for Todd is that the, he does have, not have enough Pokemon on his bench in order to actually pick up the KO with the Zorak GX. In fact, even if he were to fill up his bench entirely, he would, that would only be doing 120 damage to Ryzer's beating. He would, in fact, be 10 short of the knockout on the Greninja break. So he will be forced to use the Glycopod here. Does he have a access to an Acerodo this turn? Um, there is one Puzzle of Time. So that, I think, is even numbers because now he has two uh, Puzzle of Time left in his deck. Um, he hasn't by the looks of it, hit that Acer Roller, which means that Golisopod is going to be sitting there with 60 damage. Oh, it's, I beg your pardon, he does have Acer Roller in his yeah, hand. He, wow. He picked up from his prize card, remember? Of course he did, sorry. Yeah. Yes, he did, yeah. So there is the Acer Roller. Um, putting uh, Golisopod into the active spot there, taking the knockout on this Greninja. Um, the good news for Michael is that he will put that Greninja break back into the whole line of that Greninja back into his hand because of that splash energy, which is uh, pretty crucial at this moment in time. So there goes the Frogadier, and uh, the Greninja break goes straight on to the active Greninja there. Ultra Ball, looking through his deck, going for a Starmie, which is really big at this moment in time, because he needs to get those energy onto, the, um, onto that Greninja, uh, the Greninja break. So is he playing? Yes, he is playing in. So I'm just trying to think, in terms of a knockout here, what would he need? He would need two Giant Water Shurikens, I think. He would need a Choice Band and Moonlight Slash would get him the knockout. Yes, that is exactly what he needs. All of that in combination in order to pick up the KO. It is a lot to ask for. And he needs all of those together as well. Two Giant Water Shurikens plus a Moonlight Slash rating would not be enough. That would be 10 short. So he needs everything. He needs to... Right. I mean, the, the two energy are guaran uh, guaranteed, because you, at least, because he does, of course, have access to that space speaking ability. There's one more energy, but I don't believe I see a choice band. No, so that's uh, unfortunate for Michael, but it is a lot to ask for at this moment in time. Yeah. At least and he does get the Greninja break. He actually almost hit... He was only missing the choice band. He hit most of the things he needed, wow. which is, quite, which is uh, quite impressive. Yeah, so... Uh see what's going on here. I think uh, I think Todd's questioning whether or not that uh, Greninja evolved this turn. I don't believe that it did. That was sitting there from last turn. I think it was the Froakie that uh, evolved this turn. So that evolved from, sorry, the Froakie, the uh, Frogadier that evolved this turn. I don't, I think that Greninja was sitting there from last turn. I may be wrong. Yeah, no, I believe you're correct. I believe he uh, had two Greninjas out and then uh, he was, or are the judges agreeing or disagreeing? I'm not sure. Let's just have a look. I think um, we're having a, Going over to the judges very quickly. They're just trying to make a decision based on what has happened here. And uh, Todd is just picking up Michael on a move that's, that's just happened just now. So let's uh, hold out and see what is going on here. Yeah, my understanding was that, uh, that there were two Greninjas out. And then Michael evolved the Froakie into the Frogadier. And then that, that so means he could evolve the Greninja on the bench into a Greninja break. But because uh, then he evolved the Ativ into a Greninja break. Because that was you know, already right. out. There's no debate on that. Um, Absolutely. Now, I, I'm pretty sure that's correct. So, Michael, uh, I th I'm pretty sure at this moment in time, yes, that, that is correct, yes. Um, he did have the, the Greninja out from last turn. It was indeed the Froakie that evolved into a Frogadier this turn, which he got back through um, having his uh, Greninja break knocked out uh, with a Splash Energy. There is Space Beacon, so he's discarding one card from his hand using Space Beacon. Um, there is 60 damage on that Wimpod. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's so frustrating. It must be so frustrating from Michael, knowing that Wimpod has 70 HP. There is another Giant Water Shuriken, a very, very smart play there from Michael's side because that eliminates the threat of having uh, a second Golisopod at this moment in time. The only issue that he has is, is that he has to, um, you know, get rid of the, the active Golisopod. But the good news for, for Michael is that now Tord won't be able to get off a first impression for the following turn, which forces him to have a double colors energy to either use a crossing cut GX or, of course, to use armor press again. Yeah, he will need to find that double colors now in order to do a follow-up attack, which can actually knock out the Greninja break, and that's going to be very vital for him to find. Now, it looks like Michael is sort of agonizing here over whether it's worth doing more damage to Moonlight Slash or doing that Shadow Stitching again just to deny the, the high likelihood of uh, Todd being able to draw into exactly double colorless with uh, mm -hmm. the trade ability. And uh, this might end up being a crucial game ending or game winning decision for him. Right. And uh, I'm looking at the clock at this point. If Michael takes this game, this could go down to the wire. So very, very exciting stuff here, especially if you are a neutral um, and you are watching it from an observation perspective. There is Shadow Stitching. He is limiting the option because obviously he does have that trade. There's a Double Colors Energy in hand. He does have it. He so. has a Double Colors Energy in hand. So he does have Knockout on that Greninja break, which is huge in this matchup. Um, the question is whether he opts to, at this moment in time, 
Is he looking for another Tapu Koko? Maybe that might be um, benching the Tapu Koko and then using crossing cut GX to go to try and set him up um, with another Wimpod on the bench. That would be a very, very effective play at this point from Tords. Uh, let's see what he goes with. He only plays one Tapu Koko and I don't believe he's ever recovered any for over the course of the game. Right, so okay. I don't think that's an option for him, sadly. But it looks like he's eyeing up, yeah, it looks to be a Mr. Mime, a Wimpod and a Tapu Lele. Just basically trying to thin as many u not useful cards from his deck as possible. Absolutely, yeah. So... Um, Let's see at this moment in time, you know, he's going to go with, I mean, well, he has to attach a double colorless energy at this point to the Glycopod. It would be interesting to see. I believe that um, he should go with the Crossing Cut GX. It'll be interesting to see what he chooses to go with. Um, there he's, you know, benching more Pokemon at this moment in time. Um, yeah, so benching more Pokemon. Mr. Uh, Mime doesn't, I don't think, really has much of an effect in this game. It doesn't have much, uh, you know, usage but what it does do is it powers up um the bench should he decide to attack with um you know with zoroark uh, gx which would give him an extra 20 so that's uh, a smart play on Tord's side um he's opted to go with armor press though interestingly yeah he did i think he's thinking if he's able to find his last goes he could just do cross and cut for 150 and knock out the tapu and win the match right that's so he needs to keep the option open to him and not only that but if he does armor press the damage he takes is reduced by 20 and so that makes it harder for michael to pick up the ko as well right uh there is oh wow okay so now he is forced to finding a uh, that was a Skylar there from Michael's side uh, he used Skylar to find the, en the enhanced hammer use the enhanced hammer to get rid of that double colors energy which forces Tord at this moment in time he needs to find a double colors energy and he needs to find uh, a Guzma at this point um, but what would he go you know the, the issue he has with Guzma is that he has to retreat his own active Pokemon as well which means that he would have to then try and find access to getting that Golisopod back into the active spot again to um, use that crossing cut GX yeah he did he would so there is uh, one giant water shuriken going to do 60 to the Golisopod and it looks like it's going to be followed with another shadow, shadow stitching so does Tor find a double colorless for the win oh, well uh, double colorless Guzma or end the means to switch <laughs> <laughs> let's have a look so he does have the Tapu Lele GX which he can't bench because his bench is full um, he has the N in hand. Um, N could be a powerful player at this point just because um, knowing that Michael would only be down to two cards, um, he doesn't have anything like Octillery or like Oranguru to draw out of uh, being in a dead sort of end situation. And they're just, they're just correcting there. Of course, Shadow Citrus should have only done 20 damage because of the armor press that is right. taking the extra damage off there. And yeah, this is going to be another vital decision for Todd this time. Going to take a quick look through just to make sure, absolutely sure he knows everything that Michael's been through. And I, I'm not sure if he's able to do anything else. He might just indeed have to end. And there, there, yeah, there it is. If Todd can get a knockout on this Greninja break somehow during this turn, that could be very detrimental uh, to Michael in terms of not having a follow-up Greninja break for the following turn. I think, uh, as you say, he is just um, that double colors energy away from knocking out um, the Greninja break if it's, he uses armor press. double colors or bust for Tor. Does he find it after these two cards? What does he get? No, no. I don't believe it's two Ultra Ball in his hand. Um, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a very, a very uh, meek uh, first impression for 60 damage. Is there gonna goes, be, right. uh, Yeah, there it is. Wow. Giant Water Shuriken. And wow, Tord uh, has conceded. <laughs> so Michael, against the odds, has fought back to, to, to bring this game to a, a tie at this moment in time. We are you know, looking to go into our third game, which is uh, fantastic from the neutral perspective uh, in terms of watching this match. It's a, a fantastic contest between these two great players going all the way here to top four and going one apiece. Yeah, it's, it's been a intense series so far. Um, the, thing, the biggest factor here is going to be time. And uh, honestly, in, in a time scenario, because then we don't only have, I think it's a 15 minutes after the clock or so, you've got to favor Tord here. His deck is the fast one. His deck is the one that's going to set up and take those earlier prizes. And uh, as you know, after the turn, uh, last t three turns of time are over, in the uh, game-free situation, whoever has the most prize, whoever has the fewest prize cards remaining does win the match. So you've got to really fancy Tord's chances here unless he ends up drawing dead. Yeah, absolutely. And Tord will be aware of this at Time is running thin. Um, he, as you were saying, Nick, does have the faster deck in this case. Um, that Golisopod can start taking knockouts, you know, really from sort of turn two, if you have the right access to, to getting all the cards that you need. Um, so you would certainly have to favor Tord if this does go down to time. So it's very integral to, to Michael at this moment in time to try and play as quickly as possible to set up those Greninja breaks because... If he is set up and the prizes are you know, very equal, all he has to do is use a couple of giant water shurukens, uh, knock out something like a Wimpod or anything on the bench, and that would give him the game just based on like the sudden death ruling. So it's very interesting. Well, you know, it's, it'd be very interesting to see how this plays out. But as you say, yes, you would have to fancy at this moment in time for Tord uh, to take the series. 
Yes, you need your word. And we see there, Michael just uh, waiting for Todd to finish his shuffle as uh, then both players can get ready to set up and uh, draw for game three. The it's interesting that um, Michael's had uh, quite ideal starts in the in the past few in the past few games as well. He has been able to start with the Froakie and be able to you know get out a decent amount of Frogadiers with his uh, with his water duplicates. So it'll be interesting to see if he can uh, repeat that because again, as you just said, Jamie, it will be vital for him to set up as well and as quickly as possible if he's able to, if he wants to turn this game back into his favour, considering that his back is against a wall in terms of time. Absolutely, yeah, and. Uh, you know, if he's not fully set up uh, by the time that we go into uh, into um, when time is called, um, okay. So Tor does have uh, access to uh, Professor Sycamore in hand, so he's not. You know, he's okay. Um, it'll be interesting to see what does uh, Michael. I mean, nothing really there crucial. That's prize. That Tapu Coco is prized though. That could be. You know, a factor in this because Tapu Coco gives the deck so much versatility in terms of retreating with that Golisopod. Um Michael is actually going second in this matchup as well, which obviously, you know, going first is so integral, uh, well, integral, but it's such an advantage to this matchup. Uh, oh, because that's a really ugly second one from Tor, just uh, wanting to make sure that he's able to. He could have ended there, but I think at this point he really thinks he's thinking to himself, I need to just see as many cards as possible. I want to make sure that I have the optimal setup. I want to make sure that I bench on my win pods and my, uh, as, as many Zoros as possible. And it looks like it's not paid off, actually. Wow. Um, just let's have a look at his hand at this moment in time. So he has the Puzzle of Time, he has the Guzma, um, he has a Cerola. I can't see what those two GX Pokemon are. I'm not sure if that's a Tapu Lele GX there or not. Um, it's very difficult to see. But at this moment in time, you know, yeah. actually, wait, I'm just having a think here. If Tor, uh, Michael doesn't play any switching cards, does he? Because um, I was thinking if he had Tapu Lele GX and he went for... Uh, Oh, he doesn't play double colors either, so no. that wouldn't be an option. So, uh, but that you know, <laughs> that was certainly the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that double colors on um, on the Zoroa. But um, yeah, there is uh, Todd there going for a Brooklet Hill, trying to work out what's in his prizes. Um, Todd isn't looking so good at this moment in time. I mean, what must he, you know? I mean, he has a Tapu Lele in his hand already, so he can just use that to go for the Bridget and set up the rest of his bench. He's not going to get benched out this game. That's that's not a concern. Sure. But but yeah, not less than ideal start. It's it's kind of nice for him because Greninja is one of the few, is one of the decks where you can actually get away with not getting an ideal turn right. one, and uh, especially considering it looks like Michael had a. Well, he opted not to attach an energy. I'm not sure if he actually had access to them, or maybe he might just wanted to hold onto his hand because he's got the water energy and Frogadier ready to water duplicates next turn. But yeah, I imagine Todd here just going to have a quick look with Brooklyn Hill to make sure that he knows what's what. And then we, I imagine, again, we'll see Tapu Lele for Bridget and, uh, and we'll see Todd start to set up his bench. But the issue with, if he uses Tapu Lele for Bridget there, the issue that he has is that he doesn't really have too much to draw into for next turn. I mean, there's no kind of drawing support within his, in his hand there that I can see that is going to allow him to draw more cards Unless, of course, you know, he uses something like the Puzzle of Time that's in his hand, which would get him, you know, access and, like, manipulate the top three cards of his deck. But I think at this point he doesn't really need it, because he actually has a Grass Energy and a Golisopod already ready to, in hand to go, and he's got the Double Colorless on the Zora. That Zora is not going to be threatened to be KO'd by Michael. We saw that Michael's just going to want to Water Duke for this next turn. So, actually, Tord is pretty safe to do Bridget here, because all he wants to do is just keep up that stream of attackers, and with the hand he's got, that's exactly what he's able to do. Right, and uh, he does have a Guzma in hand as well, which is going to give him access to switching... Um, if, yeah, it, it's, it's, and he obviously has the Acerola as well in hand, which, you know, should any damage uh, be put onto the, his Pokemon, he can use Acerola to try and switch out things. Um, Michael, at this moment in time, is need to go, well, he will have to get his Frogadiers out and then use Water Duplicates and then get Greninja out and then go into Greninja Break, which is going to take at least a few turns in itself to do so. So it's very, um, you know, as I say, this is why time is such a big factor in this, because if he, Michael had a little longer, then that might be possible but at this moment in time we're only looking at around seven and a half minutes there is puzzle of time trying to see what is in his oh there's a, another I think it was a Golisopod a Grass Energy and a, another puzzle of time that's yeah. not really going to help him no, at this moment not. in time I mean and it is still kind of nice because it means that he can yeah he looks decided to leave the order sort of as is but it means he has more Grass Energy and more Golisopods ready to sort of do follow up attacks with so that's although obviously it's not great that he it doesn't have access to a draw spotter anytime soon. Still not really the end of the world. And it uh, looks like yeah, after Tord is going to attach the grass energy to the wind pod and then is going to just do, do a ram for 20 damage <laughs> with the Zora. Why not? That's right. Yeah. Um, there goes... Oh, that was a double Ultra Ball for... I can only assume... Does he have a Super Rod in his hand or anything like that that he's thinking of uh, putting them back into the deck? Um, uh, he, I'm not sure if he does straight away, but he doesn't need it straight away. He can just uh, sort of see that later. and um, Because at this point, he just wants to play as fast as he can. He plays the right. Ultra Ball for the... Frog and uh, does a Brooklyn Hill for the Staryu and then uses the Water Duplicates attack to get his 
the Free Frog ideas out. Absolutely. So he's got the ideal setup here, and you can see uh, how crucial this is to time is crucial at this moment in time. Michael is going uh, all out here. I mean, that literally, his turn took, what, like, uh, you know, a few seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like uh, 10, 15 seconds at maximum of that. Just quickly got what he needed, put it out, um, go just, you know, as quickly as possible. He needs to get those Greninjas out as soon as possible. He needs to get those Greninja breaks. Once he has those Greninja breaks out, he can just take some, you know, some cheap knockouts here and there. And that in, you know, in, in time, in some death, would actually win him the game. Yeah, so with that, it looks like Tord is opting to, or deciding whether he wants to use his Guzmo or not. He could use it to bring up the Staryu and just sort of deny that, uh, deny that energy recovery early on. But instead, no, just opting to use it to bring up another Frogadier just to preserve that Zora with the double colors later on and not wanting to discard that energy. Sure, yeah. So there is the, uh, the Frogadier in the active spot. Uh, Golisopod is now active as well. So that means that he will have the knockout on that with the first impression attack. Um, next turn, there is a Greninja going down there. Um, he can't obviously go into... Oh, there is um, Ultra Ball. He's going for Tapu Lele. He is wanting, at this point, you would have to assume Professor Sycamore. Uh, that would be his out here to try and draw more cards. Um, let's... There you go. There's the Professor Sycamore. He does need to use something like a Super Rod or a Rescue Stretcher to get those Greninja Breaks back into the, uh, into the deck because, you know, he needs those to effectively win the game. Yeah, yeah, he does. And... Uh not, but, uh, but again, he's afforded a few extra turns to do that. He can't afford the Greninja Breaks this turn, so he can afford to spend the next turn or two digging for extra cards, playing that Super Rod, and then getting the Greninja Breaks out because you do set up slowly, slowly in this manual way. So that's not a problem for him, really. Uh, what is a problem is that that timer is looking very, very low. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's looking very, very low. And uh, let's have a look to see. I think the judge has called up on something here at this moment in time. Something has, has, uh, has come up. I think the judges are intervening here. I'm not too sure what the problem is. Uh, so, uh, so it looks like um, uh, Michael removed the damage counter on his one of his frogadiers, and so Todd was issued a pri uh, was awarded a prize for that. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, which damage, count damage counters did he move? Yeah, yeah um, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, it's been fixed now, so that's, uh, that's right. So it's been, so it's been resolved. That's uh, not okay. A so that we have just got confirmation. There was 20 damage count, uh, 20 uh, damage off one of the frogadiers, and as a result of that, Tord has taken an extra prize there uh, because of that, which actually could be quite crucial at this moment in time because now Michael does need um, a, a GX knockout to at least tie the game. So there is a splash energy, um, you know. So if there is a knockout the following turn, he will have access to getting that Greninja back into his hand. So. And Michael is playing with his back against the wall here. Those Greninja breaks are in the discard pile. He does need a Super Rod or Rescue Stretcher or something like that to get them back into the deck. Yeah, neither of them are prized. We, we have a look at his prizes there. We can see it's a couple of Field Blows and an Enhanced Hammer and a few other things, but no Super Rod or Rescue Stretcher, so that is absolutely fine. He will have access to them as long as he keeps drawing cards and as long as they're not at the bottom <laughs> of the deck. But absolutely. So... And of course, we, we must remember he plays Skylar as well, so if he finds that at any point, of that course. would be an instant way for him to search for those. Absolutely, yeah. But he wants to be, you know, maintaining the stream of, uh, you know, consistently attacking. If, you know, if... Uh, let's have a look. Does he have the AC? He does have Acer Roller in hand. There goes the Golisopod, you know, picking up the damage um, that... Um, that Michael has just put down, um, even though he is under ability lock at this moment in time because he used shadow stitching, that isn't really too much of an issue just because he has the Golisopod. He's able to recover that. There goes the Wimpod back down on the bench, and uh, he's just going to go for another first impression. Yeah, and again, you have to favor Todd here. Look at look at the state of the game. There's only there's less than three minutes left on the clock, and he's already taken three prize cards. Like, like, even Greninja can make comebacks, and who knows? He had this game gone on to be on time. Maybe Michael could have even won, but at this state, that Michael's going to have such a struggle of a time to try and just get even remotely even, especially considering he's about to lose his only Greninja. He's going to get those pieces back into his hand, but because none, there are no other Frogadiers evolved into Greninjas right now, even if he was able to find the Super Rod to shuffle the Greninja Breaks back in, he won't be able to actually evolve any of them up. Absolutely, and uh, you have to think that uh, if this, as you, you were saying Nick, if this game progresses longer into, if we had more time in this game, Michael might actually be able to source some kind of comeback here. You know, looking at Tord's hand, he doesn't have anything like a uh, Professor Sycamore or anything like that to draw him out of... Um, to draw him out of uh, this situation. So, you know, you have to think that if maybe time progressed a little bit longer, perhaps Michael could have staged some kind of comeback. But just because of how little amount of time we have, I mean, we're less than two minutes on the clock here before time will be called. And um, you have to just think to yourself that uh, at this moment in time that it does look more or less done, especially with that prize penalty. Um, that is 
you know, effectively, I think, made the difference here because now, after this knockout, uh, Michael will have to take not only a GX knockout, but he'll also have to knock out another Pokemon in the process. And again, that'd be just a tie, not to win. Exactly, yes. Yeah. So, um, at this moment in time, yeah, and he doesn't even have any breaks out at the moment because most of those breaks are actually in the uh, in the discard pile. There is uh, Brooklyn Hill for the Tapu Fini GX. Uh, there is N as well. So, it's just really, really difficult at this moment in time to see how Michael can kind of come back, even if he does go for the Tapu Storm GX, uh, you know, for the, the GX attack that he has within the deck. That would not be taking prizes. That would only be preserving, um, you know, the uh, his, potentially his Pokemon from being knocked out. Um, I mean, it also puts Tor back a little bit because we did see Michael just end Tor to a free card hand. So it means that he won't be able to... He isn't guaranteed a follow-up attack with something else, which uh, he, would not, he no doubt would have done before. But in terms of what Todd sees off of this, uh, and there's, a, there's the water energy right, from Right, so Michael's that is side. exactly the route that he's going down, yep. is to get that, uh, for, that Golisopod off, um, you know, off the board. Um, at this moment in time, you know, I mean, we, we are so close to time being called. Um, it does look, I mean, he still needs, uh, it's very... I mean, he must be, at this moment in time, eyeing up that Tapu Lele GX. I mean, to get two two hits on that Tapu Lele GX with Giant Water Shurukens, that would be 120 damage, plus a knockout in the active. Um, well, oh, and actually, it doesn't even matter. Look at Tor's hand. He's got Ultra Ball and Guzman ready to go, so he can just wow. Ultra okay. Ball his hand away, and then you know, grab the grab the Glycopod, play Guzma, bring up bring one of the Greninjas, and do first impression. And I honestly... Right, okay. I, you know, I hate to call it before it's over, but I, I really 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 struggled to see Michael's win condition here absolutely just because of the, the fact that time has been called uh, you've actually you, know, you said it ag exactly as, as it is Nick um, that yeah once he gets that Golisopod out all he has to do is use Golisopod Guzma take a knockout on the bench and I think at this moment in time the game is just too far long gone for Michael unfortunately um, because time has been called uh, so that is you know how we think the game will play out I mean let's see it out until see what happens um, but it does look very uh, you know set in stone at this moment in time yeah so there you go Todd one at a time just uh, using uh, Brooklet Hill making sure that he knows where he has access to and then it'll be interesting to see if he does trade first actually because uh, he might want to not discard some of the things he has with Ultra Ball right now and it actually looks like he might be thinking about going for benching Tapu Lele maybe not no he will do trade straight away discarding sure. the puzzle of time sure and uh, we have got confirmation that Tord will be turn zero in this uh, in this uh, you know in the final turns so when turn is called when time is finally up as you can see the clock has run down to zero we go into what's called turn so Tord will have the, uh, turn zero he'll finish his turn Michael will have turn one to which he'll then be passed back to Tord which he'll have turn two and then Michael will finish up the game with turn three and whoever at that point has the most prizes will be awarded the the victor at uh, for this the, main price, the most prize cards taken sorry yeah. thank you pardon the most prize cards taken thank you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes and that will be uh, so which is why we're saying at this moment in time that because uh, Tord will have taken uh, what looks to be four prize cards at this moment in time it's very difficult to see Michael knocking out two GX Pokemon um, in two turns which would effectively tie him up the series yeah it's interesting we see he actually opted to use the Tapu Lele's one attack to grab an Acer Roller maybe just getting it ready for next turn we do know he has the Guzma in hand and that Zorok is not damaged, so you can't use the Acerola to pick up that uh, Zorok. And yeah, indeed, there goes the, you know, the Guzmo in his hand instead. going to use it to do to check w what Greninja has, what energy. <laughs> There's no splash energy in there, so he's safe. He can bring up that Greninja, take the knockout on that Greninja, and as you say, he does have that one card in his hand, which, um, you know, which Michael knows is the Acerola. So he knows that if he has, um, you know, if he does any damage to that Golisopod, that he will indeed um, just use Acerola and pick that Golisopod back up. And as if to add insults to injury, Todd actually picked up the double colorless from his prizes wow. as well. So <laughs> he could uh, just do so, a, a crossing cut next turn in theory to knock something out if he were to find a good and choice band. Although at this point, he doesn't really need to. Absolutely. And that would put the game out of sight. That would be uh, five prize cards is, I believe, uh, more or less uh, impossible for Michael to be able to take in one turn if obviously Todd has the next turn and is able to take a knockout on a Greninja. Um, one of the issues that we have here is that, as you can see with Michael, he's just put three three um, Greninja breaks back into his deck and he still has to draw them out to which he can evolve only two of them so to get two Greninja breaks out that's 120 damage to do a Moonlight Slash could be uh, another 80 damage potentially and then obviously you have Choice Band on top of that but again that's a lot to ask for um, for 
for this deck, you know, this Greninja Break deck, which doesn't really have much of a draw engine like things like Octillery, for example. No, no, indeed not. And we see there from Michael, he's able to get out his first Greninja Break now, um, but it is, unfortunately, just a case of too little too late. He can, you know, try and put the damage around the board, maybe even you know, put himself in a position where had the game gone on for longer, he might have been able to win, but not, not as it stands right now. Absolutely, and um, I think if um, Michael doesn't at least, uh, there is one prize um, that he's taken. If Michael, yeah, it's, I think that if he doesn't get another knockout uh, for this turn, I think that's more or less game. Um, I don't see a way that he can potentially try and get himself back into this. There is a, the Tapu Fini GX putting 20 damage on that Golisopod, which now gives Todd access to using a Cerolo to pick up that Golisopod and put it back into his hand. Not only that, but it actually gives him access to, if he wanted to, go for the choice band and actually win the game straight away. Um, right. can, but he, uh, Archie, maybe not since he's discarded. Oh, no, he's discarded one of his other colors. He has another one. Um, Do so you have another in hand? Yeah, yeah, he has one in his okay, hand. Great. Card to the left. So, yeah, there goes there his is other double colorless. Right, so can he search out that... Um, if he searches out the choice band, he has game here. So um, it's a case of whether... Does he want to go for the push, or is he's, he's just saying... Maybe he might just want to cement... Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I think he's just going to cement the win, because he's just going to make it to the point where you know, Michael can't hear anything, and he knows that. Yeah, there it is. There is, is the handshake. Michael concedes. Todd will win game, game three, take the match, and Todd Reckliff of Norway will, will be advancing to the finals. <laughs> that was a, a very uh, unfortunate way to end the match.